welcome to this online seminar of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. I'm delighted to receive here four great colleagues to discuss the Armenian-Turkish relationship after the terrible earthquakes that uh, uh, happened in, in, in Turkey and in Syria. It's a really important question on about how the Turkish-Armenian relationship is evolving and globally the place of Turkey in the South Caucasus in a time of really kind of geopolitical uh, uh, big tectonic shift globally over the whole uh, uh, Eurasian uh, um, territory. We have uh, uh, four great guests for today. Let me briefly present them. Uh, uh, we have first um, Ahmad Alili, researcher in international public policy and regional security of the South Caucasus. Is the director of the Caucasus Policy Analysis Center, a Baku-based independent think tanks. We have also with us uh, uh, Fatma, Fatma Muge Gochep, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan and Arbor. She has been uh, uh, publishing several fascinating books on the transformation of yeah, Turkey, Turkey and, and Turkish Ottoman history. And her latest book was Denial of Violence, Ottoman, Ottoman. Past, Turkish Present, and the Collective Violence Against the Armenians, published by Oxford University Press a few years ago. And we have also with us our dear colleague Alexander Iskandarian, a prominent expert on politics, nationalisms, and the contemporary history of Armenia and the South Caucasus. He is, uh, has published widely on uh, uh, these topics and is also a member of our PONARS networks. And uh, last but not least, our moderator, who is also uh, that I should thank uh, uh, Michael for Michael for uh, being always there to organize even for us on the South Caucasus, Mikhail Mamedov, who has a PhD from uh, Georgetown, is also a lecturer there in history and the liberal studies program at the School of Continuing Studies. At Georgetown, he is from a multi-ethnic Azeri-Armenian uh, uh, background, and he has been uh, uh, authoring uh, several articles on the history of the Caucasus and the contemporary literature and the, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. So thank you once again for being with us today. Mikhail, I give you the floor to launch the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Marlene. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, today is April 25th, and just yesterday was April 24th, day which is generally commemorated uh, by Armenians throughout the world as the Armenian Genocide uh, Remembrance Day. It's as important as probably January 27th as the Holocaust Commemoration Day. And I want to ask, I want to start with Fatima. Fatima uh, I... I would like to recall one story that happened many years ago, I believe at the University of Chicago. That's how I read it in your book. It's denial. Uh, Ottoman past, uh, um, uh, Turkish present, and denial of violence, published by Oxford in 2015. I remember you, you wrote something like one Armenian student, diaspora student apparently approached a Turkish woman in uh, some buffet cafeteria and asked her pretty stupid question. Why did your ancestors annihilate hundreds of thousands of my ancestors, right? And it was you, I believe. And the question was, of course, very stupid, but uh, your reaction was rather surprised. You were not angry. You did not tell him, well, Uznabach, <laughs> Kendinabach, look at you, you were really sincerely surprised by this question. And uh, at this point, I want to ask you kind of two questions. First of all, can you tell us just a little bit more about this episode? And first of all, how many people in modern Turkey are still aware about what happened 108 years ago, if you will start with uh, 1915? The second, uh, you believe that reconciliation with past is very important step would be would have would be very important step in Turkish progress to democracy to de uh, to democratization right that's how I read it and then I will ask similar question not the same but similar question to Ahmad and Iska and, and Alexander yes please thank you so much um, yes uh, the what you're referring referring to is uh, how I got interested in what was it happened basically when I came from Turkey to Princeton University to start my PhD. Yeah, it was uh, it was Princeton, it wasn't the University not of Chicago. Princeton, not Chicago, yeah. 
And then, you know, that's where I was asked and had that uh, reaction. And I, I, that is sort of when I first started uh, to think about uh, what had happened to the Armenians, because what I learned in Turkey, I realized was normalized and naturalized. And basically, we do not learn anything about what happened to the Armenians. I went through, as I said many times, the best educational you know, opportunity that Turkey had to offer. And uh, I had no idea where Armenians fit in any of this. Uh, other than you know what happened between 1974 and 85, when uh, Armenian sort of terrorists started assassinating Turkish diplomats, that is when it came to the public sphere, and that is when the whole engagement uh, starts. And that is also the point when I said, why do I not know anything about it? Why are these silences in Turkish history? And that is uh, another important factor why I went into the study. Why did I study uh, the Armenian genocide specifically? I was very interested in why Turkish democracy was not taking off, why the military still continued basically ruling Turkey behind the scenes. And I realized that one reason was the lack of accountability for what had happened in the past. That is, I said there must be a foundational violence in the way the Turkish Republic has founded a violence which has not been accepted but denied by the Turkish state as a consequence of which all the perpetrators of the violence became the heroes of the Turkish Republic and started the silence unless we sort of have these uh, leaders and uh, the Turkish state and its governments acknowledge uh, this violence in their own past. Um, they would continue using such violence going forward in uh, you know, solving all their problems, uh, so to speak. And that is exactly how I see the problem with uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia and I think Turkey's intervention is a con consequence of that lack of accountability there in the first place. And I also want to take this opportunity as a Turkish citizen and as a human being uh, to apologize for all the suffering uh, that uh, has been caused by Turkish state and society on the Armenians, uh, on their own uh, basic the ancestral lands. Uh, because I, as an Arantes, am not guilty, but I am responsible as a Turkish citizen living in that society and functioning in it. Uh, uh, I take responsibility, uh, you know, uh, to acknowledge that publicly, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, I want to ask one question, Ahmed. Ahmed, why is there so much concern in Azerbaijan? Why some people express so much, uh, feel so much vulnerable if somebody would write, say something about, not about something what happened with Armenians in Azerbaijan, but with Turkey in 1915. Why somebody feels so much frustrated when anyone would write a book about 1915 or about Turkish atrocities toward Armenians in 1915 in Turkey? Why it's caused so much irritation in Azerbaijan today? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question and the invitation. I would say that we have to pay more attention to the one important fact in order to understand what's happening in this uh, regard. Yeah, well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something else. You remember how much uh, uh, frustration caused intimidation against Akram Elisli, not only about his writing about yes. uh, against Armenians in Abaku, but what, what he wrote about 1915, not 1915, 1918, 1919, about the slaughter of Armenians in his village of Ailis. No, I precisely want to answer that question. My, my understanding is that Azerbaijanis are like, the, if in Turkey there are researchers who can come out and talk on this issue, I would say that's a taboo topic in Azerbaijan because Azerbaijanis are much, much more focused on 1918 events than uh, 1915 events. So 1918 was a part. Yes, there's a so many the continuation of the process. You, we have a mass graves of the the clashes took place between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, and on Azerbaijan soil, there are so many mass graves from 1918 events, 
And so that is why like the uh, Azerbaijan is, uh, Azerbaijan public memory is much more focused on that, that uh, Armenian, uh, uh, like the, the modern Turkey uh, territory, when once they were living back with the Russian army, there was uh, so many clashes taking place on the modern Azerbaijan soil that there are so many mass graves. And I believe that that is the uh, focus point of Azerbaijan public right now, than 1915 events. And so that is why in, in, in Turkey, there are people who can uh, talk about this. There are people who can uh, discuss about these issues in Azerbaijan. It's like the, um, um, like the chances of anyone coming out and talking about these topics is quite, uh, quite uh, I would say that the chances are quite low, practically speaking. Again, the 1918, Azerbaijan will focus on that, what happened in 1918. Okay, thank you. And Alexander, so... What do you think? Do, is there is any expectation of Armenian Turkish rapprochement today in Armenia? And you know, sometimes I watch these programs. My mom actually is watching these programs, Noyan Tapan in Russian. And there are some kind of very, I would say, crazy people talking about just wait. Very soon we will get territories, we will soon we will get Karabakh, we will set Ganja, we will set Nahich, we will get Nahichivan, maybe even. Moscow Cars uh, Treaty will be abolished. Maybe we will get back to Sever Treaty. I don't know who will abolish these treaties, but maybe will, everything will change in a second. Is there is any such expectation in Armenia among serious Armenian politicians, scholars? Is, is, what do you think? I think you don't need me for answering <laughs> this question. Sure not. Uh, you have different type of people and sometimes not all. Uh, three million po population of Armenia are political scientists or historians and people can think a uh, different thing and they can articulate it. But it is absolutely clear that <clears throat> now situation is uh, geopolitical situation, I would say, is very complicated. Now it's not about... Uh, about cars or, or territories of Turkey or territories, or I, I don't know what, Beijing's unification with Armenia, but it's more about the situation, vice versa. It's about uh, people who are living in Karabakh. Uh, yeah. Are they going, it is possible for them to continue their just, just physical surviving there. And we have conflict and this conflict with Azerbaijan uh, I mean, is ongoing. Uh, so you have, uh, from time to time, you have shootings, shootings you have, uh, you have uh, military actions on the border, and not just at the border uh, with uh, Karabakh, I mean, territory controlled by Nagorno-Karabakh uh, with Azerbaijan, but on the uh, border of Republic of Armenia with, uh, with Azerbaijan, uh, etc. So, uh, Sure, people in Armenia know about genocide and about situation 100 something years, 108 years ago, but uh, uh, last, it, it's about history. It's about history, it's about identity, and it's about attitude. If you, uh, if you talk about relationships with Azerbaijan, it is actual. It's, a, it's something which is going, uh, which you have now. You have problems which you have now. It's not just about historical memory. It's about political situation now. So maybe it's uh, more, uh, more important now in, in Armenian society. Okay, thank you. Now I want to go back to Fatima. I want to ask you something. In 2014, one year before 100th anniversary of the genocide, Rajib Tayyip Erdogan, I'm going a little bit, uh, I'm going back and forth. He made very surprising statement. He expressed his condolences to the Armenian people. It was, and it, didn't have, it was not really, uh, not everybody in Turkey was happy with what he said. He said that these people lost their lives, they were subject of the Ottoman Empire, they shouldn't have been treated in this way. And the reaction was pretty different. 
uh, but and somebody some people in Armenia even uh, very naively expected that he would the next year he would come back to Yerevan he would put flowers that Tsitsar can abert and this didn't happen uh, but next year he actually repeated the same things in letter to the Armenian Patriarch, but at the same time he staged his own commemoration of the Battle of Gallipoli. Uh, and so, and he, Erdogan was not always Erdogan, he's changed. Is this uh, something uh, pretty typical for him? And so how, how can you explain this? He said something in 2020, 2014, and then he says something different. Well, I think um, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is the consummate politician, uh, a politician who came, uh, you know, to being in opposition to the military that used to be uh, very much controlling what went on in Turkey until, I would say, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, 1989-91. That time is very crucial in sort of Turkey trying to redefine where it is in the world and opening to the world markets which then favor not only the Istanbul, Ankara, uh, and Izmir uh, sort of white Turk bourgeois uh, elites, secular elites, but rather those in Anatolia, uh, more conservative religiously, they uh, are able to then uh, directly get in touch with the world market, accumulate economic capital, and then translate that capital into political power. And that's how I think uh, Erdogan is able to counter uh, the military and through popular support uh, come uh, to power. When he comes to power, initially he plays literally the system, uh, by, he weaponizes uh, literally the idea of a liberal democracy, first by uh, trying to get into the EU, and when that doesn't work, uh, or he thinks it doesn't, he try and get Kurdish opening, but the, all these things for him are instrumental. Uh, and I, I, at the time, wrote actually a piece on uh, uh, the sort of apology, as I call it in quotations, because if you look at the apology literature, neither, uh, and I did it by comparing his apology to the Armenians, because at the time, at same time, he also, around that time, uh, uh, put out an apology to the Kurds too. I mean, you know, so because of the Kurdish opening. So he had two apologies. When you analyze both apologies with respect to what an apology ought to look like, as it has been discussed in the scholarly literature, you realize that it is not one. Uh, uh, two things become evident in the way he apologizes. First of all, you see from the way he does it, he doesn't understand the difference between state and uh, government, uh, you know, uh, at, at the time uh, he was doing this, uh, he, he's not aware of that because he decides uh, to do it uh, as the prime minister at the time when, uh, you know, Abdullah Gül, if I'm not mistaken, was, was the president. Uh, so that's sort of one aspect of it. The other aspect uh, of it is that he does it in very, uh, um, uh, sort of formal terms, never bringing his personality and saying, I apologize the way I did, uh, you know, at this uh, uh, meeting. That is the difference. You have to say, I, as this person, there has to be some critical reflection as to who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. He doesn't do any of that. Then you realize that this is just an instrument, again, uh, he used liberal uh, uh, democracy is an instrument and others to basically uh, in, eventually uh, consolidate his power at the expense of everyone else. As I also uh, say in that this piece I wrote for the centennial of the Turkish Republic, uh, which is attached uh, in the chat uh, in case you want to see it, it just appeared today. So that I think is That's the major amazing. difference. He doesn't mean any of it. Uh, it was a political move. Uh, and he never carried out uh, anything. He didn't carry out anything with the Kurds either, other than excluding them as terrorists. I mean, you know, so everyone who sort of doesn't agree with them are now terrorists, including myself. I can't go back to Turkey since 2015, literally, when I went for the centennial 
of the Armenian genocide uh, because I work on the Kurds and Armenians and there is the possibility that I may be arrested like Osman Kavala and Nadire Mater who are, you know, my friends. Uh, so that's where things stand. And what I do, my responsibility as a sort of Turkish citizen and a scholar uh, is to point all this out uh, uh, so that we know what the discourse is and where it's heading. Uh, it is a conservative stand. Uh, part of this our intervention in this Azeri, Azerbaijan, sort of Azeri uh, Armenian conflict is, I think, a, a, a consequence of the Eurasian sort of deep state in the Turkish uh, state and its governments uh, gaining the upper hand over the NATO uh, people. So there is this uh, uh, basic tension within uh, the Turkish deep state that is the concerns when comprised of uh, Turkish officials and officers who want to put uh, the interests of the state uh, uh, before uh, the interests uh, of, uh, of, of the citizens of Turkey or interests of humanity. That's what it comes down to. And I'll leave there. Thank you. Thank you. And Ahmed, what do you think? Do you think there was any how would people in Azerbaijan react? It? How would you react it when this, when he uh, asked, when he apologized to the Armenians in uh, 2014? There was, I don't think, was, was there is any concern in Azerbaijan at that time? Well, you know, this is actually uh, again going back to the first question. Like, the, there's certain topics that Turkey is feeling much more comfortable to make concession. Where Azerbaijan feels like extremely, uh, let's say, protective of certain ideas. And Azerbaijan being um, probably smaller and vulnerable, feeling that no, there's certain on certain yeah on certain issues you should should be more strict. That's the Azerbaijan position. So that's when 2008, when there was a uh, you know like football diplomacy going on yes, and all minus. the same going on. Yeah, uh, but Azerbaijan was much more, let's say, uh, much more cautious about that. Azerbaijan was lobbying to stop certain actions. Azerbaijan, um, I would say that back then, it would feel that it's closing something. It's foreign yeah. policy. Isolating the army is not working. So that is why there are certain steps like the uh, in Turkey, Turkey might feel comfortable to doing that, but in Azerbaijan, frankly speaking, I would say that um, the reaction for Azerbaijan from Azerbaijan would be much harsher than from Turkey on many issues, like the ones about uh, about uh, Armenia. Azerbaijan, like the, even even now, like um, Azerbaijan feels that the Turkish Armenian normalization process is good for peace, and Azerbaijan wants that. But at the same time, there is a clear understanding that if the peace process going on, like Turkish Armenian normalization process going on, without a peace deal with uh, uh, Azerbaijan between Armenia and Azerbaijan, so it means that in the some period, like the Armenia is not going to sign that peace deal at, at all. So that is why, like a uh, uh, Baku tries to control that agenda. Also, Baku tries to make sure that the, the Armenian Turkish normalization process uh, is like there is a no division between Baku and Turkey on this issue. There is a united front on this issue. So that is why when Turkey feels a bit comfortable in, in doing certain things, taking certain actions, uh, Baku, uh, I would say that Baku requires uh, uh, from its allies to uh, be more strict, practically speaking. More adamant, you mean? Um, that word also can be applicable, no problem. Okay, thank you. And Alexander, what would what what were uh, what were Armenian expectation after this statement, Erdogan statement in 2014? He made it right on the eve of 2015. Were there certain expectations in Armenia that he would? Well, your personal. We, we, did you personally expected something from uh, Turkish leadership? No, I didn't. Uh, no, it, it's not about Turkish leadership in general. Uh, it uh, it's about Erdogan, and it it was about Erdogan just after the collapse of the process of uh, reconciliation to so-called football diplomacy. 
uh, they tried uh, to, they, I mean, uh, official Ankara, they tried uh, to normalize uh, diplomatic relationships uh, with Armenia at open borders. An official formula was to, uh, to, to normalize relationships at open borders without preconditions. So uh, you should have preconditions like recognize genocide or don't recognize genocide or forget genocide or I don't know, don't talk about genocide. It was about depoliticize this, uh, this problem, this question. Uh, Sure, Armenians cannot forget about uh, genocide. It's part of our history, and in Turkey, uh, really, it is uh, is was important part of their past. You you uh, uh, you can uh, see talk talking to Turks uh, and some some people. Fatma talked about them who are in prison now, for example, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, and it failed. Now, why, yes, football, it, now, now, why football diplomacy failed, in your opinion? I absolutely agree with uh, Ahmad. It was a result of uh, Azerbaijan lobbying. Not just, uh, but mm -hmm. Azerbaijan uh, managed to be a part of not just Turkish uh, foreign policy, but Turkish domestic policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I can talk for hours about that. We have yeah. different reasons for that, not just that. But uh, Azerbaijani lobbying was uh, extremely important. And after that, I wouldn't say that somebody in Armenia could serious think that immediately Turks will uh, recognize genocide uh, after that. So no, I didn't have such kind of expectations. You know, even if I have one, one or a couple of minutes, <clears throat> You know, uh, yes, sure. Uh, years ago, uh, I was invited to one of European uh, parliaments. It was a closed session on possibility of recognizing uh, of genocide of that country. It was closed, so I wouldn't say what country it was and what people were there, but uh, it was there and. Ministers were uh, invited from both countries, and it was before uh, football diplomacy. Uh, and, uh, and independent uh, academicians. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was from Armenia, and uh, we had Turkish colleagues there. And one of our goals was, of our goals, academicians, I mean, uh, experts, we proposed positions of our countries, official position of our country, on a genocide issue. And my colleague did it, uh, and he's, he proposed official uh, position of uh, state, of the state of Turkey, that it was war, Armenians were Christians, they lived near the border with Russia, it was war with Russia, Armenians supported uh, Russians because they are Christians or some Armenians supported, Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, government decided to uh, to move them to another place, wow. mm -hmm. uh, and they did it. But uh, the the deportation was organized not very good, and people died. Yes. Uh, when uh, he proposed this, I said that, but this is definition of genocide. Yes. If some people, ethnic Armenians, did some crimes by Turkish laws, but instead of punishing of these concrete people, uh, they uh, deport all the ethnic group with women, children, elders, etc., to another place and organize it in such way that these people die. This is this is genocide. And this guy, it was closed. This guy said yes. So they, I wouldn't say that Turkey don't recognize genocide. They don't recognize world, G world. They, mm -hmm. they don't want to recognize legally uh, genocide as a term, not as a, uh, as a historian 
fact, how can they live there? And then they immediately all died. What, what to talk about? It's not about history. It's about politics. It's about political position. It's about uh, such kind of things. And finally, uh, if I can, uh, I can try to answer your question, which you give to to uh, my colleague uh, Ahmad Alile. Uh, you should, I, I think, you should look uh, at the reaction of this whole issue about around genocide in Azerbaijan in the context of attitude of uh, Azerbaijanis or Azerbaijan to Armenia, to modern Armenia. Uh, it's about conflict now. It's about attitude to Armenians. It's not about uh, historical research. Uh, we, our, unfortunately, our countries and our uh, people's war in conflict. And you look to everything through the through the angle of this conflict. As, 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 as a result, you have sometimes the anger of the genocide in Azerbaijan more than in Turkey, uh, but it, it, Azerbaijan has nothing to do uh, with this uh, with this genocide. It was in Ottoman Empire, not, not in uh, Russian Empire. So, so it's just about attitude of in Azerbaijan about Armenians uh, not not on history of uh, of Ottoman Empire of nineteen beginning of twenty yes. century. If if I may say something, yeah, go uh, yes, of course. In Absolutely. response, uh, I mean, I totally understand. Uh, you know that you you want to separate the contemporary from uh, the past, but the way denial works is that if if and when because Turkish state and society deny what happened against the Armenians, basically, we still are stuck in the past. Uh, as I, I mean, especially Armenians are stuck in the past because they don't, they are not given, uh, people say denial is the last uh, stage of genocide. They are not given the opportunity to heal and move forward. So that is why uh, there is the specter of this hanging over even contemporary situations, because I would argue that denial leads and sort of constricts the boundaries within which we can approach this. Uh, and I would also take issue with the fact that the past doesn't impact what's going on with the present, because when I was giving uh, especially talks about the Armenian genocide and its recognition, especially in Europe, it was very bizarre to me that I had Azeris who would come to my talks and then uh, sort of take me on, literally, uh, by saying, uh, well, you know, uh, what was I doing? And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. there was no Armenian genocide. So they, they, I was surprised that they would be the ones to sort of, you know, taking me on now on behalf of the Turkish state or official lobby uh, in, in England, for example, when I was giving a talk at Gold, Goldsmiths College. So... Uh, I think that what's important is Turkey weaponizes uh, genocide, uh, denial, basically in this case, uh, and uh, Azerbaijan, I gather, goes together with the big brother and, uh, you know, advocates the Turkish stand on the genocide denial all over on behalf of Turkey. I mean, I think that is a terrible use of the past at present. Uh, that one needs to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to ask Marilyn a question. What should I press in order to see questions? Because I, I see the names only. Uh, Mikhail, may I add on that issue also? Like that? Yeah, go, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's extremely important to distinguish uh, the historical narratives from the modern uh, foreign policy narratives. So uh, that's yeah. the case in Azerbaijan, I believe that so the, the historical narratives, analyzing of the past, uh, some cultural tracks, that's one thing. But uh, the Azerbaijan is much more uh, focused on that, the historical narratives and their projection of the, on the modern foreign policy making and the, how certain decisions are going to affect the uh, the foreign policy stand, foreign 
uh, policy making of certain countries, especially in the United States and other countries. So that also makes Azerbaijan much more sensitive. Uh, you know, again, like the Turkey is much bigger, so it can it has a certain degree of flexibility to approach certain mm-hmm. issues. Certain degree of let's say. Uh, it can let the certain ideas develop. But in the case of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan feels that it should not let anything um, happen in this regard. So that's much more conservative on these issues. And so that is why like the main uh, issue, like the here, like the historical narratives and the, how it's going to shape the uh, foreign, foreign policy making of some countries. Uh, that historical narrative shaping the modern foreign policy especially the uh, the powers outside of the region, they shaping the their attitude toward the region based on the historical narratives. Uh, that is quite a sensitive topic for Azerbaijan, frankly speaking. And I believe that it's Azerbaijan being, as uh, Fatma Khan mentioned, like that, you know, the Azerbaijanis are much more active on international platforms on that issue than Turks. So that is like the Azerbaijan feels that Turkey might lose something that's going to be tiny in comparison for Turkish scale. But if something that lost um, Azer- for like the, that scale, that can be a big loss for Azerbaijan. So that also drives uh, Azerbaijan's uh, public memory and the public attitude toward the issue. So I want to ask to keep that in, the, uh, in mind also. Thank you. OK, thank you. Now I want to ask a question, Matt or Marilyn. Uh, I don't see the questions on my screen. Do you know how that? Do you know how to how I can activate this menu? Yeah, Mikhail, at the bottom, if you hover your mouse over the screen, there should be a toolbar and yes. chat option. Chat option, chat, chat, chat. Yes, I see chat. Yes, so I see it to show chat, chat. Ah, again, okay, no, I just see names. I just see names, and I see article which uh, Fatma emailed, send us to us, show, okay, just a second. Uh, no, I don't see anything. I just see chat. I just see names of the yeah. people so, who are in the room. Where, where Fatma uh, sent the, the document, that's where questions will appear, should anyone Yes. See. We haven't had any questions yet. Ah, okay. We don't have any questions yet? Uh, we just don't, ah, okay. Uh, Okay, the question was how the how issue of the genocide impact normalization process? Yeah, just one question so far. So what do you think? How does the issue of genocide impact normalization process? Issue to every a question to everyone. Well, that's what we've been uh, sort of uh, arguing, you know, how does it impact it uh, in the way, uh, you know, Azeris are saying, well, we're sort of driven in our uh, current uh, sort of, or at least not Azeris. Current Azeris state policy seems to be focusing much more on on contemporary relationships and uh, their partnership with Turkey, but then uh, where history doesn't impact, but I argue, I mean, you know, and I've been arguing, uh, no, it does make an impact uh, because uh, it is that specter there in the past. And I basically wrote a whole book on, you know, how is that that denial of violence impacts uh, relations between Turkey and Armenia, at least, uh, and others uh, to this day. Um, so you can look at it uh, to see the continuities there. I think I have to sort of draw some attention. If if sort of uh, Azeris are claiming, and I don't know this because uh, I don't follow uh, Azeri uh, public discourse closely, uh, are claiming that uh, um, the genocide or Turkey's genocide denial has nothing to do with what's going on in today uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, I would argue that that is a way of silencing uh, what's there rather than it not being an issue. Uh, so that would be my argument. Thank you. It's there, I think, as a specter, and it will be there as long as the denial continues. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts? Uh, okay, I can say. Or, uh, Ahmad, did you want? Yeah, go ahead, Alexander. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, 
genocide is a main issue for normalization process with Turks. Uh, first, we really don't have this process. Yes. Uh, we have a narrative, a discourse of that, but not not real process. And second, uh, now the main impact on normalization process or uh, is Azerbaijan Karabakh conflict, not not genocide. Now you know when you look from now, uh, now I mean from from twenty twenty, after the so called. Uh, so-called Second Karabakh War. Uh, when you uh, look at situation from Yerevan, it's like paranoia. You you don't have Baku from uh, from one side and Ankara from other uh, side. Baku from the east and Ankara from the west. You have two Bakus. Uh, what they say, what they say to you, they I mean official Ankara. Uh, it's not their demand, it's Azerbaijan. It's Azerbaijan is, by, by Azerbaijan, I mean official Baku. So uh, the the problem now mainly is the Gorda Karabakh, not, uh, not history, I would say. That doesn't mean that you don't have problem of genocide uh, at all, but mainly it's Azerbaijan. Usually they say us to to, from Turkey, do what do what uh, Aliyev say, and everything will be okay. What what does mean okay is a different question, but but it's mainly about Azerbaijan, about Karabakh, and such kind of things, not about genocide. Okay, thank you. Now the question which I put uh, on the list, but which I didn't have a chance to ask: If the Kalich Daroglu is elected a president, will it change something? The same question was if a new president is elected, will it change anything? How it would impact the relations between Armenia and Turkey? How would it change the situation in the South Caucasus? I only, and, well, and that's I actually only wrote my, is, my important question. Is there, are there any chances that he would be elected? Because it's can, uh, Alexander said once that uh, Erdogan would not be living anywhere but to prison. <laughs> uh, well, the way it looks is I'm following it extremely closely. Uh, they are moving forward as if there would be elections. It's touch and go, but ultimately they think the opposition will win if there is no intervention. Uh, so the situation is still very up in the air as to what's going to happen. What if uh, Kılıçdaroğlu is the, you know, a leader of the opposition coalition. So there's a co coalition taking Erdogan, uh, and he formed his own coalition as a consequence. But if you look at uh, the coalition, because Kılıçdaroğlu is both uh, uh, an Alevi and a Kurd at the same time, and he openly said uh, that he was a Kurd, you know, uh, a stigmatized, uh, you know, identity. Uh, I think what's going to happen going forward is that they are going to say we're we're the, the narrative that seems to be emerging from the opposition is to say we are brothers and sisters with both Kurds and Armenians because we've been uh, living with them on these lands for uh, centuries and we should therefore treat them like brothers and Kurds I mean I mean brothers and sisters so that seems to be the rhetoric uh, at least in relation to the Kurds which I'm assuming they'll also extend uh, to Armenians so I'm uh, expecting a much less hawkish, uh, a more peaceful, uh, you know, stand on Turkey moving forward if they do uh, uh, come to power. Thank you. So you think that there will be changes to for the better? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, you know, this is the, one of the well discussed questions in I will look at Azerbaijan and now in Azerbaijan, and basically everyone follows the Turkish elections. Um, I would say that even more than anyone in, in Turkey, but everyone follows that. Uh, I, I, I see how they follow, but in Azerbaijan, there is uh, like the no less, uh, they follow it in a very deep manner. And the, the question is that how. Uh, what would happen if there is no Erdogan? What is going to happen to this relations? Well, there is no so, Putin. 
Yeah, exactly. So there is a, that, that question is the, one of the well-discussed issues in uh, Azerbaijani, I would say, among the expert community and et cetera. So that's true. Uh, and again, Azerbaijanis, well, they can follow Russian media, they can follow Turkish media, because the, the access, there is no limitation of the language. You can, they can follow a lot of okay. stuff. Uh, and there are a lot of questions addressed to me personally. And uh, look, I feel like I follow the news as you, but I'm not a person who believes should comment on the Turkish politics because there are people who are much more qualified to talk on this issue. But I can comment on the issue from a, a perspective uh, of a researcher who is doing research on regional security. And I believe that there's uh, a Erdogan or Turkish Azerbaijani cooperation, like a deeper cooperation, uh, the type of the cooperation that we saw during the 2020 Karabakh war. That's not the result of the, the personality of a leader in Turkey, etc. So if it was Erdogan, Erdogan is in the power since the 2020, uh, 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 2000s, right? So why he waited for uh, 20 years to come back and do that? So something happened in the recent years that uh, Erdogan uh, felt that there is a need to do much more uh, with Azerbaijan. And I believe that the reason for that is the Russian-Turkish uh, confrontation, the process is happening in the South Caucasus. And I believe that that's going to be a driving factor for a new leadership also. So the, if you take a broader look, and uh, I can talk about that a lot, but frankly speaking, but, uh, but in a very sexy manner, the way uh, the, the events in Syria, the events in Libya, the events in Afghanistan, the all the way you see that certain uh, Russian-Turkish confrontation, that also, that was the reason why we, uh, um, uh, Erdogan's Turkey got active in 2020 events in, in, in Azerbaijan. Uh, and so the question is that, will there be need for uh, Turkey to be this on the same page with Azerbaijan? Uh, that's the, the need is always going to be created only if there is a, some threat or there is a need for Turkey to do cooperation with Azerbaijan uh, to balance Turkey, uh, so to balance Russia in the region. So, and I believe that, frankly speaking, in the upcoming years, that's going to be one of the main driving forces shaping the uh, geopolitical landscape in the South Caucasus. So, yes, the personality of a leader in Turkey is going to uh, uh, take place, uh, affect the processes. But after some time, you know, that there is a certain institutional memory uh, that comes back. So, and I believe that whoever is going to be elected for some time, it can take up a different approach to the issue, but at some time, the institutional memory is going to come back and then the, the Turkish decision-making institutions are going to make the same decisions that they, they are making during the uh, leadership of Erdogan. Thank you. Thank you. So do you think that this, uh, uh, there, is, my, my note is, there, there will be no significant changes in the Turkish politics? If he, my, my if saying he that will, will be uh, elected as a president. If, if there is a someone else in Turkish politics as a leader, I would say that for short term, for some period, uh, you know, while Azerbaijan and the, the new leadership establish certain connections, etc., or the that the, for some time, for a few months, you can see something different. But after some time, uh, it's going to come back again. The driving force of the Azerbaijan Turkish deeper cooperation right now is not the effect like the, the, no, the, the yes it's the the much bigger geopolitical games in the south Caucasus. Yes. all right okay thank you and alexander what do you think i would agree uh, with with ahmed generally uh, uh you know uh first i think that it is very very possible that erdogan will re will reelect how first tour, second tour, with parliament, without parliament, with protests, without protests, it, it, it depends. But mm -hmm. you have possibility of that. Second, what does it mean uh, opposition will come to power? O opposition is not hetero, is very, very, very uh, heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous. You will have problems afterwards, even in this scenario. So I can give you, I don't know, a dozen of scenarios after elections. Second, even if uh, opposition will come to power, I don't think that it is so personal. Uh, uh, this uh, Turkish, Tur Turkish 
relationships with uh, Azerbaijan is not Erdogan's policy. It is Turkey's policy. It is strategy. It is not about just person. Yes, Aliyev, Ilham Aliyev have good relationships, personal relationships with Erdogan. Maybe some changes in rhetoric, some changes you will have, but generally significant changes. I don't think so because uh, generally it is uh, it is politics of Turkey. It's about Turkey's place or Turkey's impact in South Caucasus and even with Erdogan, without Erdogan, uh, when and if Turkey will try to uh, establish its politics with uh, Armenia, first they will ask Baku about that. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and, yeah, and this is, uh, this is not about, uh, uh, about concrete persons, I would say. Okay, and I see, so I see another question, actually, the question which I was planning to ask. This question is about Russia. What about Russian position? And I was actually planning to ask question, is Russians going, would, would Russia, will Russia try to uh, stimulate this, this process of Armenian Turkish rapprochement, or they will try to prevent this process from happening? What would benefit uh, current Russian state? Um, I, I believe mm -hmm. that let's uh, let right, Alexander go finish. first, so that I can come back and agree with him. So that's why let Alexander go first. Excuse me. Me, so. Well, maybe I should start then, since I think okay. it's a uh, totally separate, you know, way of approaching this. Uh, I totally, uh, you know, with respect to Russia's role in all of this. Uh, of course, I mean, you say that Erdogan is sort of challenging uh, Russia, but Erdogan being a consummate politician is actually, uh, I think, in my opinion, trying to uh, basically uh, play Russia against the United States in a way that would further Turkey's interests. At least that's what he's trying to do, What whether he is, uh, uh, you know, good at it or not. Uh, um, uh, I, I don't know. If you look at uh, where things are, in, I do agree that the coalition, of course, is a hodgepodge. But what they're trying to do there uh, is that, you know, CHP is the main opposition party and it's supposed to be center left, but it actually is center right in application because of its nationalist elements uh, on the one side. And if you look at, uh, you know, then uh, in opposition, a sort of uh, art party that's playing much more the religious nationalism angle. Uh, and if you think about uh, in terms of the deep states and the divide there between the Eurasian people, they, I mean, you know, advocates, they go with Erdogan. And if you think about the NATO advocates and the pro-US ones that go with Kılıçdaroğlu, at least that is evident in the way uh, the politics is divided. So I'm, that's what I'm basing my uh, uh, conjecture with respect to what Kılıçdaroğlu would do going forward. They'd be much more interested in containing, as Mustafa Kemal Atatürk said, uh, Turkey within its uh, uh, borders rather than going on these, uh, you know, various adventures as they would put it uh, all over the Caucasus or Africa or the Middle East uh, as they see it. Uh, so that is why I think they would be uh, more uh, 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 careful in, in the relationship. Ultimately, you are right if, you know, uh, the Turkish stand uh, uh, of denial continues, uh, that will still undergird both what, what Kılıçdaroğlu and Erdogan have been doing or, and will be doing. Uh, but uh, given the Kurdish sort of opening started by the opposition, uh, I'm thinking that that may also extend uh, um, to Armenia and maybe bring us back to where uh, Abdullah Gül was in relation to the soccer diplomacy initially. That's why I'm more optimistic uh, in uh, those relations uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. So any other thoughts on Russia's role in this current uh, situation? If Alexander has, yeah, go on. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, I will be very short. 
uh, it depends on Ukraine. Yes. It depends on war in Ukraine. These guys are busy now. <laughs> and they are busy not with South Horrible, Caucasus. Yes. And their interest is not on South Caucasus. And yes. they are concentrated on, not, not just them, by the way, Everybody are concentrated on yes, situation so. in Ukraine, and we will see how it's going on, when and how it will finish, or it will not be finished, etc. And it depends on that. And now I would say uh, Russians are busy. They are busy in Ukraine. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I agree with Alexander. The Ukraine is the, the factor that shapes the, the region um, uh, decision-making process at all levels. At the same time, like we have to understand the one important issue that I don't have a feeling that Russia is getting weak in South Caucasus. I don't have that feeling because uh, if before the war in Ukraine, South Caucasus was one of the many regions. Now it became a very important region for Russia. It became a life road for Russia. Before the war in Ukraine, like the, you know, Russia would have some ambitions about the, like the South Caucasus wouldn't be different. Like the Central Asia is much bigger than that. Uh, the the pre-Baltics, uh, the Baltic countries, they are the, 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 the much closer to Europe. The Ukraine borders, the other regions would be much more important for Russia, and the South Caucasus would be one of the many regions that the Russia would want to have a much bigger presence. But after the European Union sanctions and the United States sanctions, Russia has left with a very few options to do cooperation with. So it's like the China, India, uh, Turkey, and Iran. And the, surprisingly, the, the, and the Middle East, the pass that's going to connect Russia to Turkey and Iran, that's going to pass through Azerbaijan and through South Caucasus. And so only that is the road that's going to lead, like that Russia has to come to the South Caucasus through Azerbaijan territory, then through Georgia or Armenia reach uh, uh, Turkey, then through Armenia or directly reach Iran and then Middle East. But it means that the importance of the South Caucasus for the Russia increased a lot. So if before the war, let's say Russian power was the 100% and it got weaker, and now it's like the 60, 70%, uh, but before the war, South Caucasus was one of the many regions, and it would spend like the, quite a tiny percentage of this power in the South Caucasus. But now it has to get invested in terms of the uh, geopolitical investment in the region because that becomes its very the life road connecting it, its economy. It's the, the it's going to be the region that allows Russia to take a, a fresh air outside from Turkey, from Iran, from the Middle East. So that is why, like, uh, I, so I, I talk to my. Left. Sorry? We have we have one minute left. Ah oh, yes, sorry. So that is why, like that, if the, we look at the Russia and say that Russia is not behaving the normal way, how it should be behave in Karabakh and other places, so that's why it's weaker. No, it's reformatting its presence in the South Caucasus. So I can talk about language to stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I guess we are uh, we we're, we're just on time. I want to say thank you for all the participants for everybody who was in the room. And I hope I will see you uh, soon. I, I wish everyone good luck and I hope some, I, will see, I will see you soon. Have a yeah, great yeah. day.